Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 21st Annual Buffalo Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame Celebration. Tonight, we induct a distinguished class of broadcasters into our Hall of Fame. They have all made their mark on our industry and helped make Western New York the great media market it is. Tonight's inductees are former Buffalo Bisons and Sabres announcer and the current voice of the Nashville Predators, Pete Weber. Channel 7's veteran weatherman, Mike Randall. Station owner-operator of WLVL in Lockport, Dick Green. Former radio newsman and environmentalist, the late Ray Marks. Master of the art and science of radio, Jim Pastrick. And longtime 97 Rock Air personality, Carl Russo. Tonight's hosts are news anchor for WIVB TV, Jackie Walker and morning anchor at WGRZ-TV, John Beard. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from the Channel 17 studios in downtown Buffalo, Jackie Walker and John Beard. Good evening to all of you. We know so many people in this room. It is so great to see you here tonight. We want to welcome you to the Buffalo Broadcasters 2017 Hall of Fame induction ceremony. I'm Jackie Walker and John Beard and I are working together for the very first time as your MCs this evening. We're both honored to be members of the Buffalo Broadcasters and we know what a special night this is for the inductees. It is, and we've never uh, had a chance to co-anchor. This is a privilege, That's Jackie, right, I yeah. appreciate that. You know, when you talk about co-anchors, uh -huh. yeah, I, I think about, I'm going to write a book someday. Oh. Yeah, because uh, my co-anchors, it'll be about my co-anchors, the late Bob Coop, of course, Ryan Andrews, Rick Pfeiffer, Hall of Famer Kevin O'Connell, Hall of Famer Rich Newberg, who's here tonight, and for the last 15 years, Hall of Famer Don Postles, who's doing better each day and will be, be back with us very soon. Well, you talk about a book. You're the only person who's ever co-anchored with Kevin O'Connell and Don Postle. Mm. So there's at least one, maybe two books right oh there. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a huge yeah. volume oh right yeah. there. I've got the title of my book, as a matter of ah. fact, and the title would be How I Survived My Video Marriages to Eight Brawny Babe Magnets in Buffalo Broadcasting. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I'd read that. But, John, I think you're, you've got the material for a book, too. Well, I do, and, I, and it's completely done. Uh, in my head, unfortunately, getting in on papers. I don't know if you know this, Jackie. I, uh, I have a bit of an attention span problem. Oh, I mean, I I, I'm starting to do the book, and the next thing I'm doing something else. As a matter of fact, just lately, I've decided to write some country music songs. Oh. I like country music. So I like that, yeah. You can help me out. Uh, I, I have three titles, and if you like the titles, I'll finish the song, okay? Okay. All right, here's one of them. Um, if I could take your pounds to England... I could live like a king. Okay, what's uh, the next oh, one? Right. Okay, yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm winging it. Um, you're the reason our kids are ugly. Okay, all right, move on. Give yeah. me the next one, John. Well, the other one, the other one is, is a love song. It's Love Me Forever Tonight. I've heard that about you, yeah. John. Yeah, okay. well, you know, this is a, <laughs> just a thought. Uh, anyway, but I, I don't know if the country music thing's got. I've actually been distracted again by what I think will be an amazing book. And, you know, you write what you know. So it's about this guy who's a broadcaster who quits broadcasting to sell cars. That can't be true. Of course not. It's fiction. Nobody, that in real Nobody life, that would never does have. That. No, that's Nobody crazy. Does that. No. Anyway, well, we better get into what we really are here for. Um, we do have another great class of truly inspiring, innovative broadcasters who've made a powerful impact on the Western New York community. We'll begin our induction ceremony momentarily, but first, we want to bring up the president of the Buffalo Broadcasters Association, Steve Reska, to give our annual president's report. Good evening. 
Good evening. What a great crowd out there tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, on behalf of the Buffalo Broadcasters Association Board of Directors, we want to congratulate all of our inductees tonight. We also want to say thank you to their loved ones, because without the loved ones, as you all know in this business, without your loved ones, you can't do what you love to do. So thank you to all of them as well. Absolutely. Now, the Buffalo Broadcasters Association, if you're not familiar, is 100% volunteer. We have no paid staff. So everybody on the board and every volunteer does it because they love broadcasting. So for a moment, I just want to thank a number of people who have helped throughout the years, and starting off first with uh, the former presidents, some of whom, are, most of whom are here tonight. Of course, Al Anscombe started many, many years ago. Al left us a few years ago. Uh, we have Don Angelo. I know Don's in the hall. I don't know where Don is. Uh, Dave Gillen. Absolutely. Dave Gillen. There's Don. Dave is here. I know Dave is here. And, and of course, as, as everybody would call her, my work wife, uh, for the two years we worked together on, on the broadcasters, Heidi Raphael. I know Heidi. <laughs> Heidi came in very late. She, there she is. Okay, thanks, Heidi. So we want to thank them for their wisdom, their guidance, for everything they did to get us to this point. Now, our current board is 23 members strong. We have a lot of people with very different expertise, and every single one of them pitches in to do this. But I, I do want to single out a few people uh, very quickly. The first is our Vice President, Katie Morse. Yeah, we have to do that. See, Katie is the type of person where somebody says, hey, I have an idea, let's do this. And Katie says, okay, I'll do that. So without Katie, a lot of this wouldn't happen. In fact, none of the words on this script would have gotten done if Katie wouldn't have done it the other day. Um, there's a gentleman who has been the glue of this organization since day one. Every single item that happens, every single detail goes through Herb Fleming. Herb, we, we cannot do this without you. I don't know where you are, Herb. Where, Thank you, Herb, wherever you are, we, we, he's hiding, and, and like the true humble person he is, he's not going to get up and take a bow, but we couldn't do it without him. Now tonight, this incredible stage was created by Steve Monaco. Absolutely. The only problem we have is my sequined Liberace suit is still at the cleaners, and I could not wear it tonight. So, but Steve has also done yeoman's work to get this whole uh, t uh, whole event together. So we want to stay, uh, thank Steve. You'll know he's one of the guys in the tuxedos. So Steve, where he's he's there somewhere smiling. Thank you, Steve. For for the very first time this year, we are live streaming our Hall of Fame event. So you are live on the internet. We've done some uh, pre-show uh, streaming as well, interviews with some of the inductees. So that's always something new. And um, that Carl, uh, Carl Lamb and Avery Schneider are, are the ones who are in charge of that. So without them, we wouldn't be able to do it. So thank you, guys. And finally, um, the gentleman who's actually in the uh, control room right now calling the shots, and we have to be very nice to him because he'll be very nice to us and give us nice shots. And that's Jim Safe, who is directing for us tonight. Now, the Buffalo Broadcasters, we have grown incredibly over the years. And right now, we have an amazing number of programs that this volunteer organization is doing. In fact, we hear from other state organizations, state broadcasting organizations. They ask us how we do it. And we're just in Buffalo. They have state organizations. They don't do anything near what we do. First of all, and you'll hear more later, we have a mentoring program and a peer-to-peer -peer program for all the up-and-coming students, the people who have a, a, a desire to get into broadcasting. We have that program that's uh, being run, and you'll hear more about that later. Um, we are increasing the number of our continuing education programs for existing broadcasters. We have one for sales people. We have one for news people. We hope you'll uh, take part in them. We'll, we'll let you know more about next year's uh, events as they come out. 
And we also have an increase in our media night out event. And people say, what is that? Well, in the old days, it would have been, hey, I'll meet you at Founding Fathers after the show. <laughs> or I'll meet you at Mother's after my, my shift is over. That doesn't happen so much anymore. So there was an idea that was brought to our, our board a few years ago. We need to do this to get the broadcasting industry together, not for an award show, not for anything except letting them get together and talk and network and see people that they probably haven't seen outside of running into them at a story or, or whatever. So we, we have increased those numbers. We've got one in the spring, one in the uh, summer. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're happy to do that. Finally, and we're very proud to, uh, to talk about this because we've talked about the archive and digitization project for a number of years. Well, this year, we have finally taken that first step. The organization hired a uh, archivist named uh, Jim Tamaro. And Jim has actually put together the manual of here is how we're going to organize the archives, here's how you're going to list them all, and here's how you're going to make them available to the general public who wants to see it. So Jim has done that for us. We are now in the first step, and that first step is raising money. And we have hired a grant writer named Susie Solander, who will be writing grants. As a matter of fact, that's what she's doing tonight. I made her not come tonight so she can get us some money. So. We are moving ahead, we're doing a lot of stuff. If you're not a member, please join. Herb Fleming is happy to take your money. He's the treasurer. As a matter of fact, he's not letting any non-members out in, until he does. If you are a member, please get involved. We need help. You know, we have a great board, but there's always more work to do, and there's always more work to, uh, to, to spread around. So consider help, giving us a hand. And now, let's move on with the important part of the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve. Now, in addition to what Steve just told us about, there is an initiative that the broadcasters have been working on for the past three years. Each year, the group chooses a nonprofit organization and creates a public service announcement. This year, we created a PSA for Sunil's Light Foundations. Now, many of you are aware of Sunil's Light because many of you have put on your dancing shoes at their celebrity gala to help raise money to research Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We want to show you that PSA now. We want to thank Jappy, uh, Jackie Alberella for her help in it. Take a look. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a genetic disease that affects primarily boys. It causes muscles in the body to become weak and damaged over time and is eventually fatal. But today there is growing hope. New treatments and innovative drugs are helping young men affected by this disease to live longer. And here in Western New York, Sunil's Light Foundation is fighting to help those with Duchenne and making progress towards finding a cure. Find out more. Visit SunilsLight.org. Very nice. Great job all around. And we are so thrilled that uh, Sunil is with us tonight with his mother. They are right over here on the left. His mother is Dr. Neera Gulati. Say hello to them. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We also want to take a moment to thank all of you coming tonight and supporting not only the incredible inductees that you'll see later and appreciate, but the Buffalo Broadcasters Association. We'd also like to recognize our former board chairs who are here tonight, Dave Gillen and Don Angelo. Gentlemen, stand, please. There's Don. I know Dave's here. And Dave's There's right back in the back. here. Okay, hey Dave. I want to acknowledge our sponsors, 3G Graphics, Bobby Gans, Buffalo's Best Flowers, Jason Tuttle for Turning Head Salon, the Buffalo Bisons, Ilya DiPaolo's Restaurant, gave us a wonderful meal tonight, Dairy Queen on Transit near Klein, Beasley Media Group, and a big thank you to our hosts here tonight at WNED. Our thanks also to those who come from out of town to support us. We want to recognize a few other people in the audience. When we call your name, give us a wave so everybody will know where you're seated. Let's start with Mr. Don Boswell, the president and CEO of Western New York Public Broadcasting, our host this evening. Don, we thank you so much. 
Sean Shank is the Director of Membership and Marketing for the New York Chapter of the National Television Academy. That's the New York Emmys, and I want to remind you the deadline is coming up very soon. Where is Sean? In this room, right here with Rich Newberg. Thank you, Sean, for coming from New York City tonight. Bob and Ellen Simpson and Steve Fox, who have been helping us with our archive project, they're also right at the front table. Thank you both, all three of you. Virginia Horvath, the president of SUNY Fredonia, is with us tonight. There's a Fredonia table. There she is. Thank you, Virginia. Richard Novick, the senior vice president of the New York State Broadcasters Association, right in the front. And speaking of the New York State Broadcasters, we congratulate the newest inductee into the New York State Broadcasters Hall of Fame, who is also a member of the Buffalo Broadcasters Hall of Fame, our friend Sandy Beach. Is Sandy here? There he is in the back. Sandy, congratulations to you. Always nice to see uh, Rich Newberg. He's always barking with the big dogs, as oh, always. Oh, yeah, yeah, big dogs yes, right sir. in front here. Good, Good to see you, Rich. Rich. Well, we begin now with the reason that we're all here tonight, the first of our inductees into this year's Hall of Fame Awards. Our first award for the evening is the Buffalo Bob Smith Award. Buffalo Bob was an outstanding example of an individual who started as Grim Buffalo and went on to great fame nationally. Tonight's honoree is no exception. Pete Weber was a commanding voice in the world of Buffalo sports for decades. Thank you to board member Jim Safey for putting together a video look at his broadcasting journey. Pete Weber began broadcasting in 1972, breaking into the business in his hometown of Galesburg, Illinois. He then moved to South Bend, Indiana, Los Angeles, California, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Seattle, Washington, but spent its prime years covering all sports in Buffalo, 1976 to 78, and 1983 to 98. At his first Buffalo stop, Pete teamed with Sam Anson under the leadership of interim program director Al Wallach on WEBR News Radio 970. I was told that we have two guys. One was named Sam Anson, the other was named Pete Weber. They were the sports department. They were told, you're going to go and do record shows, which they didn't want to do at all. So I programmed in a lot of uh, what I thought was very hip music. I thought it was going great. And they didn't really care. I don't know where they found these songs. I don't know where they got them. I heard like uh, Inagata De Vida by Lawrence Welk. They thought that my angst was hilarious. Pete left his sports directorship at WEBR in August of 1978 to join the Los Angeles Kings as the radio and TV color commentator. He spent three years there and moved on to Seattle for a season as the Seattle Supersonics play-by-play -play announcer. Upon his return to Buffalo in the fall of 1982, he began freelance work at WBEN Radio, helping out Stan Barron's freeform sports program. Pete Weber in for Stan Barron on the Scott Bowman Hour on this Thursday night. And uh, with Scott on the other end of the phone with us from Banff, Alberta. He remained at WBEN until the fall of 1988. During this period, he also did Buffalo Bison's broadcast on WUFO, WXRL, and WEBR. Pete and I essentially were the, you know, the participants in a shotgun marriage back in 1985. Uh, Pete had been doing Bison baseball for several years. I was a nighttime sports guy at WBEN Radio, having taken over for Stan Barron a year or so earlier. The Bisons were making the big move up to AAA baseball in the American Association back then. The games shifted over to WBEN where I was, so they put us together for the home games. Pete would call the play-by-play. -play. I'd get a couple of innings of play-by-play -play for the home games and a little bit of color. It was a, an arranged marriage that to me worked perfectly because I was able to learn from Pete. Uh, we were able to work together and, and kind of convey the excitement and, and really the newness of Bison Baseball, AAA Bison Baseball, back then in the mid-1980s. Pete was a big part of my career. Pete was doing Bison's games, and I was working in Niagara Falls doing um, Rapids games. It was a, a Class A affiliate. Pete was at AAA. They needed someone to fill in with Pete. So for folks who don't follow minor league baseball, this is the equivalent of a call-up. You'd be going from A all the way to AAA. So, you're, you know, this is a pretty big move. I was a nervous wreck. Pete was fantastic. He is one of the greatest guys to work with. He would crack jokes. He'd make me feel comfortable. He'd set me up for the broadcast perfectly. I, he just put me at ease in a situation where I was a complete nervous wreck. 
He moved with the Bisons to WGR in 1988, where he called the games through 1995. I first met Pete at WGR in the 1990s. I've had the opportunity in the past few years to go back and interview him on sports figures, people that have passed away, Ralph Wilson. And he's just got a great conversation and he's got great stories to tell. And that's what we do in our business and I think that I've learned a little from Pete. In 1990, the Bills and Sabres followed along to WGR. Pete hosted talk shows with Bills GM Bill Polian, head coach Marv Levy, and quarterback Jim Kelly during that period, who was on the broadcast team for the four Super Bowl seasons. From 1995 to 1997, Pete returned to hockey, serving as the radio play-by-play -play man for the Sabres broadcast as he helped close the odd and open what is now KeyBank Center. When the Sabres moved to their current simulcast arrangement, Pete was hired by Empire Sports and covered the Sabres extensively. The National Hockey League expanded by four teams over the course of the 1998-2000 seasons, and Pete was hired by the Nashville Predators to be their first voice. He remains there today. Hey Pete, congratulations. It is a great honor. It's extremely well deserved. You're one of the greats in Buffalo broadcasting. Not only a great broadcaster, but a great person as well. Congratulations on your special night. Pete, I'm so happy for you. Congratulations on your induction. Congratulations, Pete, on your induction to the Buffalo Broadcast Hall of Fame. An honor well deserved. I'm so happy about the great success you've had with the Nashville Predators and calling NHL hockey over the last few years. And nothing but the best for you and Claudia down the road. Pete, congratulations on being inducted into the Buffalo Broadcast Hall of Fame. Well deserved, and I'm sure you've got a few other Hall of Fames you're going to be inducted into. The Buffalo Broadcasters Association is proud to induct Pete Weber into the 2017 Class of the Hall of Fame. Thank you. I, I brought my sundial just to make sure I don't run over time here. I've already started my stopwatch. I've been parts of some of these where the speeches would last 45 minutes, and uh, the leadoff guy should not be doing that. So thank you very much for this. Jackie, great to see you again. John, great to see you as well. I got to tell you, uh, if you can't tell it, how important Buffalo has been in my life, uh, my career. I absolutely love it here and love all the people. And I love the chance I have had to see so many familiar faces and some of them, this old mind can every now and then connect to names. That worked out pretty well. So thank you so much. To fellow inductees tonight, to Dick Green, Mike Randall, our Tim Russert Award winner, Noah, and then the class from 464 Franklin Street. Jim Pastry, Carl Russo, and we certainly all wish Ray Marks could be with us here tonight as well. Uh, that is uh, really something special. Now what we've seen on the opening video there is a lot of the people that I worked with and was fortunate enough to work with. But my first program director in Buffalo was Al Wallach. And I'll never forget, because Western York Public Broadcasting took over WEBR in August of uh, 1976. Wow, it's a few years ago. And didn't get the news format on the air until November 29th, which happens to be my, lo my lovely wife Claudia's birthday. Well, and you need to give her a round of applause for what she's put up with. Al had this, symptom, this little system, plastic dots over tracks of records we weren't supposed to play. And the first dot we took off was so we could play on the sound of the city still then, Fess Parker singing the Davy Crockett theme. <laughs> and we thought that was great entertainment for everybody here on the Niagara Frontier. But, but think about that. The people I've had the chance to work with just here, Sam Anson mentioned already, Jim Militello, great interns. John Hager was an intern in the sports department. Bud Bailey, Larry Lewis. And yes, I've been on a few stations here in Buffalo, so it's clear you can make the Hall of Fame even if you can't keep a job. <laughs> I, I, the mentors I had, you saw Stan Barron. 
He taught me that the first thing you do on a road trip is go into the hotel restaurant and ask for a stack of receipts. <laughs> Van Miller taught me how to deal with sports physicians. Yeah, Dr. Edgasevich. He'll take the x-rays, and if you can't afford the surgery, he'll just touch up the x-rays. <laughs> then to work with the hockey greats, Ted Darling and Rick Jennerette, uh, along with Rick Azar, who gave a lot of great advice to me, and Ed Kilgore. So, so many opportunities I had here. I had the chance to sink or swim. I hope I swam better than I do in real life, but those opportunities were very uh, great for me. My moments here, in all sports, I got the chance to announce a championship team. The Buffalo Bandits in 1993. <laughs> that was fantastic. To go to those four Super Bowls, that was fantastic. And to have the chance to open a program tonight and see my buddy Jim Pastrick with O.J. Simpson. Uh, <laughs> he just wants you to know that O.J. might be out as soon as Monday, if you were watching all of that. <laughs> Something very, very special. Uh, to do the only Game 7 win in Sabres history at uh, the arena downtown here against the Ottawa Senators in 1997, and Derek Plant scored that very memorable goal. And then to call the most incredible game I think baseball has ever seen, NPR did a piece on it. Minor League Baseball Championship Series at Denver in 1991. Game 4, leading the series two games to one, a best of five. Bisons were down 9 nothing, going to the ninth inning. 32 minutes later, what should have been the tying run was called out at the plate. Scott Potter, the home plate umpire, was declared legally blind shortly thereafter. <laughs> but I will never forget that game ever, ever will I. Uh, also here tonight, and I want to thank Phil Housley and his wife Karen for being here at our table here this evening. Mike Robitaille who we worked with on Sabres Cable years ago, which really helped with my current friendship with Scotty Bowman. He, now he's laughing at the stuff we said back then, Mike. Uh, that worked out very well for us, but also at the table is Jerry Helper. Jerry was with the Sabres in public relations, later on with the Tampa Bay Lightning in public relations, and he thought that there might be good chemistry between myself and Terry Crisp. Terry and I together on the air with the Nashville Predators from the outset for 16 years. And I thank Jerry, I thank you for that. And Terry, I thank you for the great times that we have had together and thank you both for being here this evening. I have already exceeded my allowable limit. I'm about 25 seconds over or so. I'm just going to say thank you and let the show continue. Congratulations, Congratulations. To you. you are the greatest. I'm so happy for Congratulations. you. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, I, I definitely. <laughs> uh, one of the really fine, fine people in Buffalo broadcasting over there. It's so great to see him back here. And only Pete Weber would stand up here and do play by play <laughs> and take us back to the ballpark. That was terrific. That Pete, was congratulations great. to you. Well, our next Hall of Fame inductee is the Hall of Fame television inductee. He's a familiar face to all of Western New York, and boy is he ever. Mike Randall has been entertaining and informing Buffalo since 1983. His warm personality, outstanding features, and magical powers allow him to connect with viewers in a unique way. It's impossible to show you everything he's done in a brief video, but thanks to BBA Vice President Katie Moore, Course, we did our best. Take a look. You know, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be part of the Eyewitness News team. In 1983, that wish from his audition tape at Channel 7 came true for Mike Randall. Randall was hired as a feature reporter back in his hometown of Buffalo after working in Virginia and Connecticut. Hi, I'm Mike Randall, co-host and associate producer for TV3's PM Magazine in Hartford, Connecticut. Photographer Ed Riley was told to show Randall the ropes at WKBW. Well, the first thing I realized about Mike is I didn't have to teach him anything. He was so talented and creative. That, hey, I can't eat this thing. It has a worm in it. And then when you combine that with a warm, funny personality, he would just go out and people would light up for him. And every day was like a fun adventure shooting a story with Mike Randall. Randall delivered daily features for the 7 Eyewitness News team, highlighting everything Western New York has to offer. 
came up with some special series along the way. One Tank Getaways, he knows Western New York and the roads around Western New York more than anybody. He went and did the Goofy Games, which right up his alley. Buffalo team captain Mike Randall standing by to bring us a live satellite report. Something strange in the neighborhood. We did lots and lots of ghost stories and we won a big award from the Associated Press in 1980 for the Great Ghost Chase. More than 30 years later, one of those stories remains a mystery. We actually recorded what we thought were sounds from a ghost. When we came back to the station, Mike was looking at the tape and he said, Ed, what are all these funny sounds on the tape? Did you do something? And I said, no, I didn't put anything on the tape. To this day, 30 some years later, I still don't know how they got on the tape. The temperatures are going to be a little bit easier to take. Than they in 1989, Already Randall branched out at WKBW, anyway, filling in to do weather while football, getting his meteorology degree from Mississippi State. It was the same year the station decided to launch something brand new, local news in the morning. Well, who's this over here? Well, read the script. Go oh, ahead. Oh. And they had Mike in mind. We were the first on the air. so. All of the people who are up early now and have to work early, you can thank Mike Randall for being successful with Ann Edwards early on. Randall stayed on the morning show for 10 years with two co-hosts. In 1992, he started wearing another hat at WKBW, or should we say spacesuit, with the relaunch of Rocket Ship 7. Good morning, Space Cadets. It's Saturday morning time once again for Rocket Ship 7. Captain Mike here. I think Mike just always wanted to entertain people and make them smile. And when you worked with him, you felt that. And the smiles continue when he's off air. Tap it a little harder. No, put some, ow, ow, ow. Now just blow on the rings. Nicely done. A performer at heart, he puts on magic and puppet shows across the area. And if you didn't know this was Mike Randall. But I don't take much stock in that though. You might think you were hearing from Mark Twain himself. I would sit there in the audience and I would think, I can't believe this is the guy I would go out on stories with because he seems like Mark Twain. He doesn't seem like Mike Randall anymore. No, Mark. Well, it is a great pleasure to be here. Over the years, he may have done his share of monkeying around. Oh, thank you. But above all, his passion for Western New York shows through. When you cover a community, you should really have a love for the community that you cover. Because Mike does love this community, he loves the people here, and it comes across in the enthusiastic way that he portrays everyone and everything in all his stories. Well deserved, and I can't wait to see what you have in store for us in the future. The Buffalo Broadcasters Association is proud to induct Mike Randall into the 2017 class of the Hall of Fame. Thank goodness this is not a virtual set. I need something to lean on. Uh, just uh, before I actually start my speech, I have to say I see so many friendly faces out here tonight that uh, people that have meant so much to me over the years. John DeShulo, where are you at? Mr. Television, God bless you, John. He bought me suits so I could be on Good Morning America. Out of his own pocket, no doubt. Nancy Sanders, who was not only our assistant news director for so many years, but our interim news director twice, and everybody loved her. No one would have ever won an award at Channel 7 if she hadn't submitted all of the tapes. So thank you, Nancy. And Barry Lillis, where are you? I tell him this every time I see him, but my mother had the biggest crutch on Barry Lillis. We loved Tom, but she kind of had the hots for Barry. <laughs> She thought he was adorable, and, and he is. So it's good to see all you. I didn't want to get political tonight, but I do have to say, uh, before the show, I did take a knee. <laughs> but it was to say a prayer and to thank God for all the blessings that I've had, because it's unbelievable that I've been able to have a career and do so many fun things over the years with so many supportive coworkers, my family, and my friends, and it's been a lot of fun. Hall of Famers, Jackie and John, nice team. Going to do a good job here tonight, thank you. And I talked to uh, Hall of Famer Keith Radford, and I kind of asked him, you know, what, how to do this, because he's been through it. And he said, stay humble, babe. <laughs> and mention my name. <laughs> so I did. Uh, Got to thank Katie Morris 
for jumping on that grenade because she had to weed through a lot of junk and I uh, hope it didn't traumatize her because she is a real news person, unlike me. And, uh, but I thank you, Katie, you did a great job with that and I appreciate your efforts. A lot of fluff there. Uh, I have a special place in my heart for blonde morning anchors. In fact, I married one in 1982. She's right over there, Kathy Randall. And she has been my partner in all things for over 35 years. Our finest collaborations are sons, Nick, Adam, and Ben. And uh, we couldn't love you more or be more proud of you guys. Of course, Kathy has been my sounding board, my coach, and my personal assignment editor for almost four decades. So I thank her for that. Uh, wait till you get to Bill for that, Scripps. <laughs> Jerry Fidel would have called my wife a news ninja, and he would have been right. I love you, babe. So glad Rick Swenson is here. Rick is here to celebrate with me tonight. And Rick was hauling camera equipment around back in the day when it was actually heavy and cost a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, that was before they came up with the idea to make everyone a photographer and give them a cute name, MMJs. But uh, thank you, Rick, for your years at Channel 7. And we had a lot of fun adventures we shared, and we turned some of them into stories. And my apology, because I never knew how hard your job was until I had to pick up a camera. But I thank you for that. And uh, if you get bored in retirement, I'm always looking for a good photographer. It'll be our secret, and I'll pay you under the table. <laughs> Ed Riley celebrating with me tonight, and thank you for your efforts in that video, Ed. Yes, give him thunderous applause, because... <laughs> well, don't, don't let that innocent face fool you. He's been at Channel 7 longer than I have, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, uh, he had a major, major career shift a couple years ago when he was uh, transformed from a brilliant photographer to a brilliant reporter. And yes, he finally came over to the dark side. I want you to know that there isn't a person who works with Ed Riley or near Ed Riley that doesn't envy his talent, his artistry, and his willingness to share it. It's been my honor and pleasure to scramble through dozens of ghost stories, goofy games, game shows, toy fairs, Indiana Randall, seven countries, one tank getaways, and countless other stories and series throughout the years. The memories are here forever, and if not, then we always look at the tape. <laughs> All right. Meanwhile, of course, Ed's wife and my wife are out having breakfast while we're working our tails off at Channel 7, but we'll have our day. Rick Swenson and Ed Riley, two of the best who really never complained about anything and always delivered, just two of the photographers who helped me grow up at Channel 7 from a 29-year-old dopey kid to a dopey curmudgeon that I am today. The list includes D.L. Webster, where are you? Raise your hand. Tina Dunbar, Joe Ackerman, Kevin Mindler, Chris Coel, Jay Laurie, Lou Cilelli, Tony Jones, Bodie Petrov, Arnie Posner, and Mickey Ostriker, and many, many more over the years. I was starstruck when I started working at Channel 7. I mean, who wouldn't be? I was 29 years old. I was working with the Mount Rushmore of anchor teams, Irv, Rick, and Tom. And I was so excited that some days I couldn't even sleep now I can't sleep because I'm old and my dogs like to go out a lot. But I still get very excited when I get a good story. It's humbling to think that I'm following in the footsteps of those giants, Irv, Rick, and Tom. And some of my childhood heroes, like Buffalo Bob Smith, Dave Thomas, Mike Marion, all men who were excellent broadcasters and not afraid to be seen with puppets. Thank you to my employer, E.W. Scripps, for transforming our place back into a sane, happy place of work that we can be proud of, and yes, thank you. And thank you to Mike Nurse, our GM, for keeping me around and putting together an awesome team headed up by Rob Heverling, our news director, and Aaron Mason, our assistant news director. And we all find places where we think we can make a difference in the community. And it has always been my honor to get to know Gina Browning and Bethany Clock at the Erie County SPCA 
where they do great work 24 seven and allow me to help out once in a while. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thanks to the, all the brave patient people who have allowed me into their homes and lives, letting me disrupt their world with a camera and a microphone to tell their stories. And God bless the loyal viewers who have hung with me through all the hats I've worn and sometimes jumpsuits. <laughs> Feature reporter, morning host, weatherman, Captain Mike on Rocket Ship 7. Audiences can be incredibly kind, loyal, and forgiving. Mark Twain said the two most important days of your life are when you are born and when you figure out why. <laughs> I was in high school, I think, when I saw a Channel 7 reporter named Henry Lawrence try to fry an egg on a hot car. Well, it wasn't a hot car. It was a hot day. It was a warm car. And I think it was at that moment that I decided I wanted to do fun stuff on TV. I had no idea that it would lead to all of this, but I'm so glad it did. Thank you. Thank you so much. He has changed the face of Buffalo Broadcasting with his tremendous versatility and just a really wonderful guy. Yeah, I, I'm still tired from watching his tape. I know. <laughs> well, we work in a business that is uh, almost always about being seen or being heard. That's what we do. But no matter what, we all know that it's the people behind the scenes that make everything we do possible. Every year we honor somebody who made his or her mark on the broadcasting world in a significant way and who did it in a way most viewers or listeners would never know. The L. Anscom Award is named after the man who was program director at WKBW Radio and helped Channel 7 become what it is today. The award is presented every year to an executive who throughout his or her career has demonstrated excellence in leadership and service to broadcasting. This year's inductee is Dick Green. Thanks to board member Jim Safe for this video look at his career. A native of Western New York, Dick Green began his broadcasting career in the summer of 1969 at WYSL on the 18th floor of the Statler Hilton. Dick and Larry Levitt were the entire WYSL sales department. Dick Green and I worked together back in 1969. It was our first radio jobs. He went on to buy a radio station in Buffalo, locally owned and operated, and has made a success of it. You gotta love him. I first met Dick Green when we worked together at WISL when it was owned by the McClendon Corporation. I was a DJ, he was in sales, and frankly, fortunately, our paths didn't cross all that much. My fondest memory of Dick Green was him leaving to go to WBEN. It was just a joke. After an ownership change in 1975, Dick left the station to go to WGR Radio. After six months there, Ron Rice called and convinced Dick to move to WBEN Radio, where he became sales manager at Rock 102 WBEN FM. In 1981, Dick Green started Culver Communications and bought WLVL in Lockport, a station he still owns almost 50 years later. I met Dick Green in 1981 when he bought WLVL from Hall Communications and uh, he brought local ownership to the station and uh, something he's maintained over the years. Dick told me one time he had gone to one of these regional broadcasting conventions and I said, oh really? I said, how did things go? And he says, well, they went great until I got mugged. And I said, you got mugged at a broadcasting convention? He goes, yeah, I was coming out of the hall and a couple of guys mugged me and he goes, but it turned out okay. I gave him half cash, half trade. In 1989, Dick competed for and won a Class A FM license in Big Flats, New York. He then built and signed on WGMM, GEM 97. He sold the station in 1995. Then in 2008, during the height of the economic crisis, Dick purchased WECK AM 1230. He put WEC's sister station on the air, 102.9 FM in 2011. My fondest memory of Dick Green was the fact that as owner of WECK, he 
he wasn't around all that much. He didn't bother what we were doing on the air. And that, quite frankly, is not... In the summer of 2016, Dick put WLVL sister station 105.3 on the air. Dick Green belongs in the Hall of Fame because all of all his years in sales and now for the past many, many decades as an owner of radio stations, keeping them local. And that's so important in a, you know, in a city like Buffalo that thrives on local ownership of radio, television, whatever it may be. And, and Dick is a great example of what can be done as a local owner. Who loves Dick Green? Dick, I want to say congratulations to you. I know you were there with me last year when I went in into the Hall of Fame, and I salute you, and I'm right there with you. A pat on the back. You're a terrific man, a terrific human being, and I couldn't see anyone better getting into the Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Dick. Dick, congratulations on being elected to the Buffalo Broadcasters Hall of Fame for me and the entire staff at WLVL. It's well-deserved. The Buffalo Broadcasters Association is proud to induct Dick Green into the 2017 class of the Hall of Fame. Wow, I am so honored uh, and a bit nervous, I must tell you. <laughs> um, I got to say, though, it's, uh, it's exciting, and, and I love just being up here with all you people. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Uh, when I started at WYSL on the 18th floor of the Statler Hilton, I, uh, I never dreamed I'd be in this business for almost 50 years. It all started with Larry Levitt. At the time, I was at the Buffalo. Yep, you betcha. <laughs> I was at the Buffalo Evening News at the time. I handled all the uh, restaurants, nightclubs, and funeral homes. And uh, Larry came in one day and placed an ad for the hullabaloo scene, if anybody ever remembers that. Uh, we, had, we became friends. Uh, I joined the sales department over at WLVL. Larry and I were the sales department at LVL. Our sales manager was, was Warren Michael Kelly. What a guy. <laughs> the staff at WLV, WYSL, I said LVL, didn't I? <laughs> WYSL at the time could be labeled a, the who's who of Buffalo Broadcasting. To name a few, Sean Grabowski, Kevin O'Connell, Jerry Rio, Jim Bradley on the air. Tim Kelly, Warren Michaels' son, Jim McLaughlin was there, Ed Little, both of them did 2020 News, Bob Bender, Robert W. Taylor, Tom Tonahue, Jim Pastrick, salespeople like Paul Danitz, Ron Schrutt, Ken Dodd, Bob Mysick, Shane Brother Shane was there, <laughs> Virginia Quigley, there were many, many more, including the, the whole staff of WPHD, Great relationships developed uh, by their diverse personalities. And that, along with the music, formed the product that we sold. We were all in broadcasting, whether you're in sales, administrative, engineering, or programming. In my mind, you're a broadcaster. We really attracted, what really attracted me to the business is that it's clearly a people business. As a salesperson, I didn't really want to sell tires or furniture or nuts or bolts. They didn't talk. They don't have a personality. <laughs> uh, they, it was really fun to sell people, okay, their personalities. When I went into a, when I went into a client and talked to them, it was, it was a, a pleasure being able to present something very unique that nobody else could present because we're all different, of course. Um, that is really what hooked me on the business. After li leaving Whistle and PhD, I worked with gro more great people at WGR, including Dick Aaron, Jim DeFiglia, Frank Benny, Stan Roberts, General Manager Harold Kelvin at the time when I started there. 
When I arrived at GR, Harold called me in his office and he says, Dick, selling radio is easy. All you have to do is do what you say you're going to do. Thank you, Harold. <laughs> then Rod Royce called me. He asked me to join the team over at WBEN and Rock 102. What an incredible sales staff they had there. Bob Russo, Ron Rice, Bucky Ewing, Ron Schrutt, Pat Chimay, Bruce Johnson, and many more. And up, up until then, I really thought I was having a good time building relationships and sales. And little did I know just how much fun was in store to, for me working under the astute guidance of Mr. No Dice Rice. <laughs> Every day at WBEN was an absolute trip. We set sales records, but it was almost an afterthought. We all worked hard and played hard. Even when we played at WBEN, the clients were involved. We had our uh, WBEN softballers softball team. One night at Delaware Park, when we were playing against the staff of Tuxedo Junction, I was uh, hitting fly, fly balls out to the uh, outfielders for practice. As usual, we were waiting for Ron to arrive. Ron had several, shall we call them, character type friends, one of which was Nevada Mac. I don't know if you remember Nevada Mac, but he was a young flamboyant guy with a lot of money. He also had a brand new Cadillac convertible, convertible with a foghorn and a brand new, and horns, you know, the steer horns on the front of the car. He drives into, into, onto the field while I'm hitting fly, by, fly, fly balls, and I hit this ball up into the air, and it landed right into the front seat of their car. Ron still talks about how he caught it one-handed in the front seat. <laughs> Well, at WBEN, I had the pleasure of working with the greatest morning man ever at WBEN, I think, Clint Buhlman. And uh, what a gentleman he was. One of the packages we could sell there was the Clint Buhlman Morning Drive segment. It was open for 12 non-competing clients. And uh, it was really a pleasure to sell. Uh, People like Schmidt's Garage, Hangarers, Erie County Savings Bank, Car Muffler. Having a segment sponsor on your, on your sales list was like gold. I mean, you never had to service the client ever. Clint did all the work. All the clients loved him because he got excellent results for them. When a segment sponsorship became available, we'd all scramble to sell it. So I had been working on selling Jay Schiller at City Mattress. This was when City Mattress started. They were on the corner of Harlem and Sheridan, if you remember, one store. And I was up, able to set up a meeting with Jay and Clint. And while Clint and I are pitching Jay on the package, one of Clint's theme songs came over the speaker system at City Mattress. Da 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 na 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 da na da na. I don't know if you remember it. I probably can't sing it very well. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Clint went nuts with excitement. He starts dancing all around the store. It, Jay and I looked at each other in complete amazement, and needless to say, I made the sale. <laughs> <laughs> then I became the manager of Rock 102 FM. Bruce Kaiser, Debbie Stamp, Bill Reardon, Sheridan Green, Sharon Green, Mike Whalen, all made my life as a manager a piece of cake. We did promotions like the Calls of the Wild and the Bumper Bolt promotion, where we gave away a Triumph TR7 on both sides of the border, one on the US side, one on the Canadian side. I traded them both out. <laughs> then came my huge opportunity, buying WLVL in Lockport. With the help of John Robshaw, is he here by any chance? No? OK. He helped me a lot. And other investors, we raised enough money to buy WLVL. On September 25th, 1981, we closed on the purchase, and the new challenge of being an entrepreneur began. Great staff members who were there at the time, Hank Nevins, Paula Falcioni, Mike Casale, Janet Fleming, helped in the transition to ownership. 
And I wouldn't call WLVL, running WLVL a small market radio because of its proximity to Buffalo, but selling community remotes, high school sports, shows like Tradio, are products that are so difficult to sell in a larger market. We, I mean, I tried it at WEC when I bought it. <laughs> uh, at, but it's really fun and rewarding when you're at a station like WLVL. Being connected to a radio station that is, essential and a, that is an essential part of the community is truly gratifying. Doing the news and sports along with the obituaries means a lot to those stations and those, that audience. Picture this, it's a Saturday afternoon. Our sportscaster, Norm Palmer, is to doing the play-by-play -play of a high school football game. We cut away during the break in the action for a live remote at Young's Gardens and Pet Supply at the Lockport Plaza with good neighbor Dave Marmon commentating and announcing on none other than a gerbil race. <laughs> then back to the game all produced very nicely by Ray Sherman back at the station. <laughs> only at WLVL. In 1989, through the FCC's 8090 docket, we were able to apply for and was awarded a brand new Class A FM station in Big Flats, New York, right between Elmore, Elmira and Corning. GEM 97.7 went on the air in March of 1990. This was done on a budget of $170,000, including $80,000 working capital after we went on the air. <laughs> we started out as kind of an upbeat, beautiful music station. The audience loved it, but the advertisers didn't. <laughs> we, we switched over to oldies. I hired a girl by the name of Bridget Langendorfer, who came over from WMBO Radio in Auburn, New York. What a job she did for us. Fantastic. We really did very well there. It, I ended up selling the station in 95 to Bob Olin from WCBA in Corning, and that enabled me to buy out all my stockholders from WLVL. In 2008, I bought WEC, W-E-C-K. That was March of 08, and the worst time to buy anything. <laughs> the plan was to have the financially stable hometown, 1340 WLVL, see the new hometown, 1230 WECK. Unfortunately, we had personalities, we had great personalities, but not great ratings. We then switched format to a homegrown, the homegrown breeze format. Tom Shue and I came up with that one. We then, uh, and with the hope that it would garner some ratings because we put 102.9 FM on the air. Still no ratings. <laughs> so then, uh, then we switched over to the adult standards format with Tom Donahue in the morning. And uh, we got the best numbers since Chet Musilowski owned the station back in the late 70s. We had a 2.7 share. Our sales weren't great, weren't quite as high as when it was a news talk station, but guess what? We actually made some money. <laughs> And that's not bad. <laughs> owning, great, owning WECK was a great learning and stressful experience. Would I do it again? Probably not. <laughs> Back at WLVL, I feel much more at home. It's a real pleasure selling commercials in the AM Drive show featuring 15-year morning man Paul Oates, along with Hank Nevins coming over and doing local news for Niagara County. They both wanted to be here tonight, but they're going to be up in a couple hours to do their show, so they said hello. <laughs> but now, if you'll just indulge me for a minute, I want to thank some other people that really helped me big time along the way. And that is longtime business manager at WLVL, Sherry Schuler, uh, by Prentice, who helped me financially, uh, Marilyn and her dad and mom, Jerry and Arlene. Tom Shu, who I had already mentioned, Dave Polito, who helped me start WEC Radio, my mom and dad, Meg and Dave, of course, my fantastic kids, Heather, and my son David, who is not here, and of course my 
my life partner, Mary Lou, who heard all the ups and downs of the last 10 years. And I know this may sound a little bit hokey, but my, the next station I buy will have the call letters WHHH. W, of course, because it's east of the Mississippi. And the HHH, because I'm honored, humbled, and happy. Thank you. Congratulations to you, Dick. Some wonderful memories there for Very all nice. of us. Our next award is a Broadcaster's Memorial Award. It's given every year to a deceased Buffalo broadcaster whose contribution left a lasting impression on our industry. Tonight's honoree is Ray Marks, who worked in both radio and television during his impressive career. Ray Markowitz grew up in South Buffalo in a Polish family. He spoke the language and was very proud of his heritage. Ray was a South Park High School teen who, according to his family, began his radio career around the age of 15 in the 1960s. On air, Ray was known as Ray Marks. In 1963, Ray worked at WCGR in Canandaigua. At just the age of 20, he served as program director at WLSV. Later, he worked at WABY in Albany, hosting an all-night program. Ray went on to serve as news director at WJTN in Jamestown, WGR, and WBEN. Ray always had a great sense of humor and wanted everyone to laugh in the newsroom. It helped to lighten the load of stressful news days. Ray Marks was somebody very special. A newsman, serious about that, but the beauty of Ray Marks was he didn't take himself too seriously. But Ray was the perfect guy to be in at WGR Radio when they made the transition from a music station to being a news station and a talk station. I was very happy to have called Ray a friend of mine. He was running news while I was running sports. He did a much better job at his area than I did at mine. But congratulations to Ray Marks. I can't think of a more deserving candidate. I do wish he could be alive to accept it. Ray also served at other radio stations through the years in his broadcast career, including WYSL, WPHD, and WGRQ. He also had a stint in television, once serving as a producer and assignment editor at WIVB. Ray was also an adjunct professor at St. Bonaventure University, Buffalo State, and Madai College, teaching broadcasting and speaking. Ray also served as a great mentor to many students who were in internship programs or other young generations of broadcasters, helping to guide them at the start of their broadcasting careers. Ray and I were such very, very good friends from the very beginning. We didn't start at GR together. We actually started at WYSL together. And we both came over around the same time, and we always conversed about what he was doing in news, what I was doing as a jock. I was the music director at the time, and he'd comment on the music, and I'd comment on the news. But Ray, I can tell you, there were three great news people that I worked with. I mean, there were a lot of great news people, but Ray was one of three. One was Jim McLaughlin, one, one was John Zack, and the other was Ray Marks. And they were, they were all fantastic, but Ray, very special with me in my mind, and we talked constantly on the phone. He was always commenting on how, what was going out in, in Angola because he was teaching um, a lot of uh, disabled servicemen how to fish. And that translated back into radio because he was always teaching young people the business, and so many of them went on to so many other things, and there were a lot of young ladies who started out in radio with Ray. and. One in particular that I remember was Emily Smith and went on to go to CBS in New York, so she learned well. I'm pretty sure with Ray Marks that Ray would be absolutely thrilled to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. He would be humbled by the whole experience, knowing the people who have gone in there before him, and, and I think it's a very fitting thing for Ray, but he, he would be excited. 
And along with his passion for broadcasting, Ray had an incredible love and devotion for the outdoors, environment, and Lake Erie. He was an avid fly fisherman and served as a local liaison for the Veterans Administration's Healing Waters Project, teaching wounded vets how to fly fish as a therapeutic setting. Lake Erie was number one for Ray. Uh, he had a vision probably 30 years ago that the lake would be a great draw for tourists, a uh, uh, fishing mecca. <clears throat> and he would go out on his rowboat, uh, occasionally take us out. And um, when he was producing, uh, whether he was producing or on the assignment desk at Channel 4, he would always want to do a story on the lake. He would always push for it and lobby for it. And uh, I'm glad that he lived long enough to see that actually happen, to see his vision come true. And as we know, uh, the waterfront is just something else now. Then in 2013, Ray began a courageous battle with leukemia that he shared publicly. He held court with a microphone at his own benefit before receiving a bone marrow transplant. His benefit drew a huge crowd of broadcasters from radio and television and many friends and family members, showing how loved Ray was to his broadcast and local community. Mayor Byron Brown even offered a proclamation declaring it Ray Mark's day. Everyone had a great Ray story to tell. Sadly, Ray died at the age of 70 in February of 2015 at Roswell Park Cancer Institute. Ray's son David wrote, his father's love of radio and specifically unbiased news was at his heart. He knew how important it was to have unbiased news to the health of the country and democracy. Ray Marks, we salute the great memory of your broadcast work as you are inducted into the Buffalo Broadcasters Hall of Fame. A special thanks to Pat Felgall for that video. Now, please welcome Ray's daughter, Cheryl, who wants to share some thoughts about her father and her brother, David, as well. As Jerry said, would be so humbled and honored by this. Um, he truly did have a passion for what he did. And I think his biggest passion was the mentoring and the teaching. Um, he, just, he thrived doing it. Um, when Dad became sick, it became clear to me and the rest of our family that uh, he made an impact on people, and this goes to show it. So thank you. I'm going to read this straight out. Um, Thank you very much. My sister Cheryl and I are happy to accept this honor on behalf of my father, Ray Markowitz. Many of you knew him by his radio name, Ray Marks. I know my father would be overwhelmingly overwhelmed by this reward. I remember a little boy, as a little boy, how my father would come home from the newsroom at WGR and keep working. We would sit down at dinner while watching the news, and if anything big was going on in the world, we would all hear him going, shh. <laughs> I remember that a lot. Um, his passion never left him. Ray Markowitz loved what he did and was grateful to all the people that helped him along the way. He told me when he was 14 years old and needing some direction in his life, a guidance counselor at his school asked him what he want, was interested in and what he wanted to do with his life. Not surprisingly, he said, a disc jockey or radio man. The guidance concert went out of his way and asked a friend in the radio business to let him come in and watch. I unfortunately don't remember the gentleman's name, but that was it. For weeks, he did just that. Then after seeing my father was serious, the counselor let my father set up the carts and start, started to teach him the business. That was it. He was hooked. Eventually, he found his way into the newsroom and never left. Ray Markowitz was always involved in the radio and media in one form or another. One of my favorite side jobs of his was when he did the voiceover for a hunting video, playing the part of a whispering turkey hunter on a hunting video. It was funny to hear my father's voice whispering as if he was in the blind. He also brought occasional humor to the newsroom, 
Anyone remember the Campbell Soup commercial? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping a few would know. Since the announcement of my father's induction into the Buffalo Broadcasting Hall of Fame, my sister and I have been touched by so many of your memories about him. I know my father would be deeply and truly honored by this reward, and my sister and I are very proud to accept it on his behalf. Thank you all. At this time, we're going to take a brief uh, pause from our induction ceremony. Every year, we remember those broadcasters who made an everlasting impact on our industry and on our lives. We want to take a moment and pay tribute to those who have left us over the past year. Very special names there. And while we honor and remember those who have passed, we also want to celebrate those who will shape the future of Buffalo Broadcasting for years to come. The men and women who will continue the traditions we celebrate here tonight and make all of us proud. Right now, we'd like to bring up our past president, who is also the vice president of corporate communications for Beasley Media Group, to present our next award and tell us more about how our association is working with future broadcast Please welcome Heidi Raphael. Hi, everyone. It's great to be back. Um, and I'm just uh, so humbled and honored. And to watch these videos, it's just it's just fantastic. I mean, all the great talent that comes out of Buffalo and continues to come out of Buffalo. One person who loved all things Buffalo, broadcasting, and of course, Bills, was the late Tim Russert. Born and raised in South Buffalo, he, he was one of our area's biggest boosters. When he died unexpectedly in 2006, it seemed only appropriate to carry his legacy on in the form of a scholarship dedicated to broadcasting students. Beasley Media Group provides a $1,000 scholarship, which is awarded to a student interested in a career in journalism or broadcasting. The scholarship is named after Tim in honor of the vast contributions he made to our industry. This year, we are honored to present the Tim Russert Medal of Merit Scholarship to Fredonia Stewart student Noah Masiewski. Uh, he's a senior at Fredonia State, and he's already on the air at KISS. So let's give him a warm welcome. And uh, he's a future leader in our industry. In 2008, following the death of Tim Russert, the Buffalo Broadcasters Association established the Tim Russert Medal of Merit to honor and encourage the best young broadcast journalists, just as Tim Russert did during his professional life. This year's recipient, SUNY Fredonia's Noah Maciejewski, has a dual major in audio and radio production at Fredonia. Hey there, High Noon Friday listeners. Noah Maciejewski here for another WDBL Hot Hits Countdown. Thank you so much for joining me again this week. Starting you off... He's been a member of the Fredonia Radio System's Executive Board, Program Director of Fredonia State Internet Streaming, and is the new General Manager of Fredonia Radio Systems. He has received multiple national awards from the Intercollegiate Broadcasting System and has been hired part-time by Intercom Buffalo. Noah is entering his senior year at Fredonia State. It's with great pleasure that the Buffalo Broadcasters Association presents the annual Tim Russert Medal of Merit Scholarship Award to Noah Maciejewski of the State University of New York at Fredonia. No, 
This is one of our future leaders. So when you see him and you, you have the opportunity, please talk to him. And frankly, serve as a mentor to him because all of the kids that are coming up through the ranks are looking for really good mentors and everybody in this room has so much to offer. So let's do that. Let's pay it forward and, and help students like Noah and other students that are in this room and beyond. You know, let's show them the ropes and show them how it's done. Thank you so much. You're welcome. At this time, will you please welcome to the stage board members Anne Marie Franzak and one of our former Tim Russert Medal of Merit winners, Carl Lamb. Congratulations to Noah. We are all sure that you are going to do wonderful work in the broadcasting field. Well, this past year, the Buffalo Broadcasters Association completed its second annual student mentoring program, and three outstanding students were chosen to participate in a six-month program, which provided them with the opportunity to meet and speak and connect with uh, broadcast professionals working in their chosen career paths. And we are pleased to recognize students who completed the program. Noah was one of them, and Emery is going to introduce the other two. One of them was Kelly Khatib, a Buffalo State senior who will graduate in December. She is interning at WIVB-TV and has previously interned at Spectrum News Buffalo. And John Hollinger, a recent graduate from Canisius College. He completed an internship at WGR Sports Radio 550 and WIVB-TV and finished a summer fellowship with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. John can't be with us this evening. He is pursuing an MBA at Palm Beach Atlantic University in Florida. We would also like to thank the mentors who took time out of their schedules to work with the mentees. So many professionals from both the television and radio industries volunteered their time to meet with the students and be uh, a guiding force for them as they begin their own broadcasting careers. Thank you again. Let's give them a round of applause. I want to make sure we get a great picture of these young people because we will be seeing much more of them in the future. No Just doubt. terrific work there. We have two final awards tonight. The first is our Behind the Scenes Award, and there are many who work in broadcasting considered unsung heroes. We've worked with a lot of them. They are people who make the station run smoothly and with distinction both on and off the air. Tonight's inductee is known for doing just that. Since his radio career began in the 1960s, Jim Patrick has worked tirelessly in so many aspects of the business and had enormous success. Thanks to Pat Feldball for this look at his career. Live from Buffalo, it's Jim Pastrick. Oldies 104.1, good times, great oldies. Hi, it's Jim Pastrick. You know, there's so many great voices in rock. Jim Pastrick began his professional radio journey in 1968 as a weekend announcer at WBNY-FM and morning announcer newscaster at WMMJ-AM, Lancaster, New York. In 1973, it was nights and weekends at WYSL-AM. And in the summer of that year, Jim was hired at WKBW as a summer replacement all-night DJ. Jim Pastrick on KB15, your great American music machine. Bobby Goldsboro, summer the first time, KB15, your great American music machine. Mentored by Jeff Kay, he also worked as an associate feature producer for the Buffalo Bills radio network and later transitioned to production director. In 1975, Jim became program director at Oldies 1550 WBVM Utica. I first uh, ran into Jim, and we were in our early 20s. Um, we hung around with a bunch of guys that were all on different radio stations, and we'd hang around together. 
and we were all in our early 20s, except Santella, who uh, lied about his age. But uh, uh, I knew from the beginning that uh, Jim was going to be a star because he was good at everything he did. Uh, he, he was a, a, good, a good radio announcer. He understood the music and enjoyed it. He was a great production director. I mean, he was a program director. He uh, did, did record shows. He did talk shows. In retrospect, that's probably not surprising because he knew how to talk. Um, but he excelled at all that. I mean, that's a quadruple threat. Not only did he, was he good at all of those things in a business that we know was very difficult to hold things together financially, and uh, he was also a, a family man, which, as we also know, doesn't always work out, but it worked out for Jim. And, uh, you know, I mean, he was a, in my, in my world, Jim Pastrick was a great success because he could do all those things, hold it all together, and still have a sense of humor and be a good guy and, uh, and be dependable. He returned to Buffalo in the summer of 78 as production director and weekend DJ at QFM 97, which later became 97 Rock. Jim Pastor. Classic Hits 104.1, WHTT, Memphis and Motown Monday. It sounds great. In 1985, he joined WNYS-FM as afternoon drive air personality and production director, also holding those positions when the station became WHTT-FM Classic Hits in September 86. Rich Communications in 1990 offered an opportunity to return to 97 Rock as air personality and production director, as well as feature producer for WGR and the Buffalo Bills Radio Network. In 1995, he became program director of WGR News Radio 55, a position he held through 2000. Let me share a few memories about Jim Pastrick with you. First off, there's no truth to the rumor that he has a portrait of Dorian Gray hanging in his attic. He's always looked young. We were in college together in the 1960s, if you can imagine that. Jim went to Buffalo State. I went to UB. Jim worked for WKBW as Dr. Don Wade. I worked at PhD as Jim Santella. After work, we'd meet at the locker room and argue for hours about radio programming. Even in those days, Pastrick had a pervasive knowledge of broadcasting. He even had a first class license. Now what that meant is that he could fix the equipment as well as use it. He could tell you the tower height of a 250 daytimer in Ames, Iowa. What makes Jim such a great broadcast professional and friend is his willingness to share his abilities with all of us. I'm so glad we can return the favor by awarding him a place in the Buffalo Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Jim. Jim returned to WHTT in 97 Rock in the early 2000s, working on air, in production, and as feature producer for the Buffalo Bills radio network, all the while doing freelance production for stations and clients. Jim has earned a reputation as a top professional in both the art and science of radio, and he's always been happy to share his knowledge and skills with co-workers and to encourage and mentor newcomers in the business. And that's why the Buffalo Broadcasters are proud to induct Jim Pastrick, a true professional, an outstanding broadcast talent, and even better family man and friend, into the Buffalo Broadcasters Hall of Fame class of 2017. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, members of the Buffalo Broadcasters Association. 
In this, my fleeting moment of attention and recognition, I stand here with genuine gratitude and a sense of wonderment, having arrived here with a little help from my friends and to a much larger extent, with the guidance and support of my entire family, especially my wife, Lynn, our sons, Michael and Stephen. Through the years, they've kept me focused on what is truly meaningful. They are the greatest reward I will ever receive. It's an honor to be included in this class of inductees, the class of 2017, because we stand on the shoulders of the men and women who preceded us, those we watched, those we listened to, those we emulated. Most of us never even imagined that we would meet these people, let alone work with some of them. I owe a debt of gratitude to countless people who, when it would have been easier for them to say no, instead said yes. They gave me a break in the wonder years when I wondered if I'd ever get into the business. Dan Nevereth. He allowed a 16-year-old high school kid in the Junior Achievement Program at KB to watch him perform while he did his afternoon drive show. That's like winning the biggest contest on the radio, and you never had to be caller number nine to win. <laughs> Danny McBride, a respected Buffalo broadcaster who gave numerous people their first break in the business, gave an eager and very green 17-year-old his first paying part-time job as a weekend announcer playing the music of Frank Sinatra, George Hearing, and Barbara Streisand at WBNY FM 96, which today happens to be Mix 96. It's a small irony that my voice sometimes appears on that very same frequency. Thank you, Bob Richards. Because of the tribal elders, those who helped me when I was young, I tried to do my best to pay it forward. As my career progressed, I advised and assisted students from Fredonia State, Buffalo State, Canisius, and Tripp, deserving veterans, Mark and Sue Leitner, thank you for coming up from Fort Myers this evening and surprising the daylights out of me. I also would, from time to time, reach out to the folks on the west side. JP, I am filled with pride when I hear these people, observe their accomplishments, and look at their success. You know, growing up, many of my friends collected comic books, which is not unusual. I subscribed to Broadcasting Magazine. <laughs> now, looking back, had I collected and saved the comic books, I would have been a far richer person <laughs> had my mother not thrown them out like all the baseball cards. But when it comes to the memories of those days, there is no argument I could not possibly be a wealthier man. Much like today's generation is plugged into video games and their smartphones, I was plugged into a six transistor radio. And I was getting lessons from the College of Philco, Zenith, RCA, and Delco. Radio geeks knew all the call letters. I was not the biggest radio geek. Jim Santella gave me far too much credit. There are bigger geeks, smarter geeks, and more successful geeks in this business. Witness Randy Michaels, who knew everything about everybody across the country. Now, the real radio geeks knew the real names of the DJs on the air. And the really, really real radio geeks, they knew the names of the house DJs at WNIA. Tommy Thomas, Mike Melody, Mac McGuire, all those guys. The guys who really knew radio said, oh, that's Mike Stein or that's Jim Seward. Oh, okay, let me write that down. Now think about this. If KB ever used the phrase, be big, be a... See that? There's an upper demo line right there. 
Nicely played. Very well done. Thank you. If KB ever used that line, it'd be on 100 radio stations across Eastern America. When my family moved to Buffalo in 1964, I discovered KB. I was enamored of it. I was addicted to KB, WYSL, WGR, and yes, WNIA. They were my go-to radio stations along with the stations like CKLW, WCFL, WLS, WABC, all these call letters that today maybe apply or appeal to people who are maybe 35 and older, but they carry such a great legacy. KB and Buffalo had great legacy names. And there are also great legacies among the women Liz Dribben. Could somebody give me a chair, by the way? <laughs> I'll only be a few minutes, I promise. Doris Jones. Sheila Murphy. And so many from WGR Radio that I have had the great honor to have worked with who are here this evening. Thank you. They're all part of Buffalo's rich and influential radio and television history, which the Buffalo Broadcasters Association celebrates this evening. At one time, Buffalo was a top 20 market. It was a destination place. Today, it hovers in the mid-50s. Some people view Buffalo as a mere stepping stone in their careers. Fine, I understand it. But to me, it will always be a destination market and always remain influential, in large measure because of the people who live here and work here, on the air and behind the scenes. They serve their communities in which they live. During the relatively brief period of time that I worked at KB, I learned a lot from the bigger-than-life personalities who dwarfed me, especially Jeff K. He's a man recognized for his accomplishments on the air and in the production room. As a program director, he was a motivator without equal. He was also an outstanding writer, as demonstrated by his adaptation of Orson Welles' War of the Worlds for Buffalo and his weekly football production, Buffalo Bills Replay. In Jeff's shoeboxed size office at 1430 Main Street, there was a lithograph on the wall behind his desk, a scene of snow-capped mountains, green fields, and streams. And on that poster, there was a caption that I remember to this day. It read, To do something common well is to do something uncommonly well. Most of my work behind the scenes was really quite common. But every day, I attempted to do it uncommonly well. And so, here I am. Being inducted to this hall tonight leaves me genuinely humble and grateful to the many people who made this possible. If not for you, I would not be where I stand today, as I stand today, abundantly blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hard to believe uh, our night's nice coming to a close. We only have one award left. We've heard some great voices oh, sure at have. this microphone tonight. Our final award is the Hall of Fame Radio Award, and the recipient, no stranger to anyone in this room, especially those who are fans of classic rock. For decades, Carl Russo has rocked audiences from Buffalo and across the country. His impressive career is one to be admired and honored. Thanks to board member Jim Safe for this look at Carl's career. From heinousness on the highway, classic hard drive and rock to blowing in the fuzz, 
Carl Russo has dominated the afternoon drive slot at 97 Rock for decades. Now, when I was a kid, uh, see, I, I was the youngest of four, so my big sister used to be stuck with me on you know Friday or Saturday nights. So I'd be riding around in the car with her and her girlfriends and be listening to WNIA and WKBW and listen to these guys on the radio, uh, being a jerk and having fun. And come to find out, these guys made money doing this. You know, albeit not that much, but. I said, you know what, this guy, he sounds like he's having fun. I want to do that when I grow up. Carl started at 97 Rock in August of 1980 while still doing a 6 to midnight shift on WYSL. He would run down the street at midnight and do the midnight to 6 shift on the weekends. Carl went full time in 1982 as the midnight mayor on 97 Rock. Then in 1983, he took over the 7 p.m. to midnight shift. Carl grew up a block away from me. Uh, I was on Clarendon and Carl was on Berkeley. And uh, quite frankly, Berkeley scared me because Carl lived on Berkeley. He was, <laughs> he was a, uh, I don't know what it was. He just, he gave out this vibe of, you know, don't mess with me. But uh, the, the great second part of the story is that years later, uh, Carl and I were reunited uh, at the studios of 97 Rock. And uh, I discovered that uh, Carl was not that scary guy from Berkeley. Uh, he's just the, the kindest, smartest, um, most committed broadcaster you'd ever want to meet. And, um, I just felt la very lucky then to, to one day be able to call Carl my friend. Welcome to my home in Florida. As you can see, I've kind of decorated it to look like the 97 Rock Studios. That's how much I miss it. In fact, truth be told, I even make my wife dress up like Rob Lederman sometimes. So. Here's your coffee, sweetie. Oh, thanks. Morning. Morning. So, oh, I forgot the reason you're here. What a, what a guy, really. How much can you say about a man who's a consummate professional, uh, everybody liked him, always hard working. We're talking about Jim Pastrick, right? When 97 Rock left the airways in January of 1985, Carl landed in Indianapolis at WFBQ, dominating the seven to midnight shift. Carl was the highest rated album rock nighttime jock in the United States. In June of 1988, legendary rock station 98 KZEW in Dallas, Fort Worth stole Carl from Indianapolis. In his first ratings period at KZEW, he beat their crosstown competitor and went on to syndication through the United Stations radio network in July. In the fall of 1988, 97 Rock was back and so was Russo. We're back. You know, if somebody would have told me that 97 Rock would return and I'd be back here in Buffalo, I'd have said they were crazy, but my whole family came back and we're all home now. There's something special about Buffalo. It's home. I met Carl at 97 Rock when I was hired as a part-timer in 1981 and Carl was the senior part-timer at that point and then he went on to become the overnight guy and the seven to midnight guy and then I kind of followed him uh, and then uh, we returned the station after it had gone off the air for a couple of years in 1988. I was hired as the PD and of course the first call I made after Larry Norton was to Carl Russo. Carl is a volunteer firefighter EMT at the East Seneca Fire Company. He served five years as a fire commissioner, helping to improve emergency services in the town. Carl Russo is known for a lot of things, for being a volunteer fireman, for being a race car driver, for playing the banjo. People ask all the time, does Carl really play the banjo? Yes. Carl Russo really does play the banjo, and we so loved listening to dueling banjos around the office all the time, <laughs> dueling banjo, but nobody would go camping with him. Along with being a highly rated afternoon drive jock on 97 Rock for the past 30 years, he has radio duties on the Westwood One Radio Network, doing two five-hour classic rock shows on approximately 150 affiliate stations. Carl's voice also travels the country, from New York to L.A., doing commercial voice work. Carl and I have known each other for a long time. We're actually about the same age. He's only a year or two younger, but I've gotten so much older and grayer and balder, and Carl still looks so young, and oh, he doesn't dye his hair anymore? Okay, never mind. Don't, don't use this. Carl, congratulations on going into the Hall of Fame. Uh, I'll be sending my award back soon. Carl, it's been great working with you. 
over 30 years and I look forward to many more. Congratulations on your induction into the Buffalo Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Carl, my heartfelt congratulations on this well-deserved honor. Uh, you are a Buffalo broadcasting legend and uh, it's great to see you get this recognition. The Buffalo Broadcasters Association is proud to induct Carl Russo into the 2017 class of the Hall of Fame. Somebody said, oh, he's not going to bring his banjo, is he? <laughs> See that door? Don't let it whack you on the way out, my friend. <laughs> I taught myself, you know what? If, you're, if you need something in your life, even your life is so consumed with other things, pick up a music instrument and do something with it. Amuse yourself. Next thing you know, you learn three chords. <laughs> You're a genius. People, you can play Sweet Home Alabama. You know, people think you're a genius when you learn three chords. You play it with a couple of bands, you have some fun, you release some tension. It's a great thing. When I was a little boy, stuck with all these Italian high school girls, listening to, you know, NIA and, you know, Mouse La Tempio and all these nice girls on the West Side. It just got it started, so I have to thank my big sister for really getting me started in this. And... There's a few other people I got to thank. I mean, I work with some of the greatest people in the business. I mean, li first of all, listening to yours truly, Bewley, on the way to Catholic school in the mornings. And then, you know, the Terry Thomas, Jerry Jacks, Mike Melody, uh, Merle Moron, all those guys on WNA. You know, I was like, that's, I got to do that. That's great. So thanks to my big sister and my, my, uh, my brother and my, my other sister. Uh, for all the support over the years. Mom, very proud. Dad, you're going to be a lousy bum kid. You know? <laughs> it's never going to pan out. Now he's like, oh, really? You doing what? Yeah, you're a lousy bum. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I, a lot of times keeping mouth shut and ears open really worked to my advantage because get in there, I'm getting in there, I'm having my fun, and I'm ripping it up, and you know, hoo-ha! But listening to, learning from Mike Rosman, you know, I went in there as an intern. I went in there as an intern. Mike Rosman saw that I had a, a technical aptitude, and he said, here, you know, you're going to reload the audio tape on these cartridges. I load 1,500 carts of different lengths from the machinery, you know, learning production techniques from him and Jim Pastrick, blading tape, and being on the air, so blading tape techniques, you know, you, you record your phone calls, you're doing request hour, just in time, you lay the last piece of splicing tape on and re-rack the tape, and just as the record's ending and you're cracking the mic, you're ready to hit that tape deck. It was, uh, you know, doing production, doing multi-track production was thanks to Jim Pastrick and Mike Rosman, you know, and learning from these guys, some of the greats, working with Tommy, and, and Danny, and learning what humble and great is. And I grew up, you know, going to high school in the city of Buffalo, Mafiette High, <laughs> all my Italian buddies, running around the streets of Buffalo in gangs. And what I, you know, some of my buddies in school, hey, how do we get our hands on some chicks? I said, hey, I know. We could be cheerleaders. You know, you know. Lift them up, and yeah, well, no problem. So we did that. And one of the, uh, there I, my, I had plenty of comments during, during practice. One of the teachers said, Layla Placey, Carl, after she was done saying some things that I can't say here, if you could channel that energy someday, you can make a living at it. And I did. And thank you, Layla Placey. That was, that was great. So thank you, thank you to my first program directors. Humble Harv Moore and Dean Matella getting me on WYSL doing 6 to Midnight. You know, that was, it was a great thing. And then starting on a 97 Rock, running down the street doing 6 to Midnight and then Midnight to 6 on 97 Rock. Uh, I got to thank George Harris, my first program director at 97 Rock. said, all right, I'll give you a shot, kid. And uh, Paul Hine and Brian Kriz and Tim Smith, some of my program directors after that, helped me just to become a greater human being. 
and uh, Pete Weber. And oh, working with Pete Weber and working with Ray Marks. All we did was laugh. Oh my God. That Campbell's Soup commercial, that line, ah, make me fart like a bastard. <laughs> you know, it still rings in my head. You know, Ray Marks, all we did was laugh because I did my thing at the other end of the building and he did his thing and we got together in the middle of the building. We weren't doing anything but laughing. You know, oh, it was just a wonderful thing. And then John Otto, getting together with John Otto and bouncing it off John Otto. I love John Otto. Oh, my God. We would do the same shift. So I always had a party going in the back of the building. You know, Buffalo Jill's showing up, hanging out in the studio. I was like, hey, listen, why don't you go down and flash Otto? <laughs> and on his break, he'd come down. Oh, Cherche La Femme, it is to say. Yes, yeah, see, Carmel Hue, yes. <laughs> So, uh, to be, to go into, oh, and Radford, run into Radford over the years, you know, here and there. What a great guy, you know, just talking to the likes of me, first of all. A guy with, with you know, with his kind of history, talking to a little lousy bum kid, telling me, you know, we'd hang around the station, the Stones would show up, and Beatles would show up, and I would talk to, and I'm thinking about it, you know what? In my era, it was kind of the same, you know? Ozzy would show up at the station. And I've got, a, you know, some of my West Side buddies. Hey, Ozzy, this is Bastard, Scabby, and Joe Prick. You know, and Ozzy's, hi, oh, you bastard, you know? You know, and uh, the Scorpions, and, you know, Journey, they come out, let's get a baseball game, and we play, you know, baseball with Journey. There's a picture of Jim Pastrick with Neil Sean, the guitar player from Journey, who came from Santana. So it was kind of the same thing, a different era. Uh, just learning from these guys and living life and being out in the streets and living life with the bikers and driving stock cars. And my wife came to see me for the first time to drive a stock car at Lancaster Speedway. I bought Rock and Ronnie Sepaniak's car. And uh, coming out of turn four, the, the front tire, the right front tire would, would be, it was like Lou Alcindor dribbling down the court, that thing. Couldn't hang on to it. I'm in the front of the pack, foot to the floor. I'm not letting go. I'm hanging on to it. My team manager, you know, team captain would say, shut up and hang on to it. Put your foot in it. So I got a foot to the floor. I'm coming out of turn four, and I'm bumped from behind, and I'm out of control. And your, driver, your passenger side is, you know, is along the front stretch wall. I hit the front stretch wall over 70 miles an hour with the driver's side. That's what my wife saw first. When the first time she saw me, he destroyed this car. Put the steering box in the water pump. This car was destroyed. They asked me what hospital, uh, you know, they, what hospital you want to go to? And they, you know, I got out of the car and fell on the ground. Said, what hospital do you want to go to? Said, hospital? Well, what day is it? I don't know. I had a concussion. So, well, what hospital do you want to go to? I, said, I don't want to go to the hospital. It's my birthday. Give me a beer. You know, but. I just want to say thanks to uh, my family, all my friends that are here tonight. My friends have been so supportive all my life. Mike Bigmouth and all the guys from college. Thanks to all my general managers that are here tonight, Meltzer and Bill Sauer and Mr. Tremendous. And tremendous. Uh, I just want to say, it, just to, to go in while I'm still alive, number one, and number two, while I'm still on the air. It's, wow. I'm floored. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thanks to my wife and son, Salvatore Pasquale. They've both been put putting up with me for... Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's probably a good thing that Carl went last. You know, the Campbell Soup commercial alone will put us over the edge here. Also want to mention that Carl's son was engaged in quite a football game tonight. West Seneca East versus Hutch Tech, right? And who won? All right, there you go. 
He left the football game. He left during the football game to come home and see Dad. So uh, to come over here and see Dad, and that's that's offense terrific. and defense. Yeah, that's right. Plays offense and defense, and it's getting a little rest right now. Congratulations to Carl. That was absolutely terrific. And we want to have each honoree stand at their table now, so that we can recognize everybody who was honored tonight. Please stand now. Mike and Pete, Dick, Noah. Congratulations, Jim Pastrick, and of course, Carl. Absolutely wonderful and some great memories shared with us tonight, gentlemen. Congratulations to all of you. Wow, what a, what a great year, huh? Well, as we wrap up our evening, we want to thank our sponsors one last time, including 3G Graphics, Buffalo's Best Flowers, Buffalo Bisons, Ilio de Palos, Dairy Queen on Transit near Klein, Beasley Media Group, and all of our friends here at WNED. Now, don't forget, uh, we love getting together to induct a new class into the Hall of Fame, of course. It's always a fun night for everybody. But we also want to keep in touch throughout the year. Our next event is the Holiday Luncheon, and this year it's conveniently in December. And you can, uh, you can buy your <laughs> tickets online now. <laughs> conveniently. Also, tonight's award ceremony was recorded for future broadcasts, so you can relive the magic once again. Mark your calendar to watch WBBZ TV, and I know uh, owner Phil Arno is here with us tonight, on Sunday, December 17th at 5 p.m. So December 17th, 5 p.m., they'll be showing this show. We're also hoping to air the show on other platforms, so keep an eye on the Buffalo Broadcasters Facebook Facebook page over the next few weeks for more information. And you can order a copy of tonight's show or other ceremonies from past years. The Hall of Fame program is available as a special collectible DVD package. You may order any year from 1997 to 2016 at buffalobroadcasters.com. And one last announcement. Every year we take a picture of our newest inductees along with current Hall of Fame members. So in just a few minutes, we'd like to have everybody who was inducted tonight or is a member of the Hall of Fame to come up to the stage here so we can get a group picture. Thank you so much. You know, it occurs to me tonight, we are blessed, aren't we, to work in this field. It is crazy. It makes us crazy. We work hard. We work crazy hours, all those things. But we serve our communities, and we do some darn good work. Thank you. We hope to see you next year. Good night, everybody. Thank you.